There is no question that vitamin D is essential for optimal immune function, but that doesn't mean it will give you superpowers against COVID, and it is possible to get too much of a good thing. Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and back there is Julie Oliver, my assistant. In this video, we will be looking at claims about vitamin D. Oh, vitamin D, as it's called in England in relation to COVID and other respiratory infections. We will be looking at claims that are supported by the evidence, claims that aren't really supported by evidence but are definitely biologically plausible, and claims that are downright ridiculous. But first, let's go back to the science and look at some vitamin D basics. The first thing to know about vitamin D is that different people use different units, which makes things rather confusing. In terms of vitamin D itself, it is either measured in micrograms or international units, and one microgram equals 40 international units. In terms of blood concentrations, it is measured in nanograms per milliliter or nanomoles per liter, and one nanogram per milliliter equals 2.5 nanomoles per liter. And just to make things even more confusing, nanomoles per liter is also sometimes referred as nanomolar. Or NM. Vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin because it is actually made by the action of UV radiation on the skin and it can also be obtained from some foods or supplements. However, the form of vitamin D from any of these sources, which is called cholecalciferol, is not biologically active and must be further converted by the body before it can be used. The first step occurs in the liver where a hydroxy group is added to the vitamin D. A hydroxy group contains an oxygen and a hydrogen atom, and it is added to the 25th carbon of the vitamin D, hence the name 25-hydroxy-D. Another name for an hydroxy group is an alcohol group, and that's the reason for its other name, calcifidiol because it now has two alcohol groups. The one it already had, which is shown in blue, and the new one, which is shown in pink. And it is this form of vitamin D that the body uses for storage. So when we talk about vitamin D levels, which we will soon, this is the form we are talking about. The final step to make it biologically active occurs in the kidneys, but can also happen in immune cells. And in this step, another hydroxy group is added. In this case, it is added at position one. So its name becomes 125-dihydroxy-D or calcitriol because there are now three alcohol groups. So now you're all organic chemistry experts. Let's have a look at vitamin D levels in the body. The most important thing to know about vitamin D levels and overall health is that it is a U-shaped curve as opposed to a linear relationship. So it's not good to have levels that are too low or too high. But first, let's look at levels that are too low. Generally, if your levels are below 50 nanomolar or 20 nanograms per milliliter, you are considered to be deficient. And there are quite a lot of people who are deficient. Between 50 and 75 nanomolar is generally considered to be insufficient. So not actually deficient, but not optimal for health. Once you get above 75 nanomolar, studies show no consistent benefit. And vitamin D levels above 125 nanomolar have been associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality, certain cancers and cardiovascular disease. Finally, levels above 375 nanomolar are considered toxic. Now, it's fairly rare for people to obtain toxic levels of vitamin D, even with supplements. Unfortunately, a lot of people have latched onto this and are claiming that it is therefore completely safe to supplement with large doses of vitamin D. What these people are ignoring, or perhaps they don't know, is that mortality and health risks are increased at much lower levels than toxic doses. So that's vitamin D in general. Now let's have a look at how vitamin D interacts with the immune system. Vitamin D actually performs a number of roles with regards to the immune system and it would take a whole video to discuss all of them. But I will just briefly discuss some of its main functions. 
Firstly, it promotes a number of innate immune functions. And innate immune functions are general immune responses that aren't specific to a pathogen. So this is a good thing. Vitamin D also attenuates the inflammatory response. Now, this can be either a good or a bad thing, depending on when it occurs. The inflammatory response is an important part of fighting infections. But in some people, it can continue even after the infection is cleared, which is definitely not good. Finally, vitamin D can attenuate the adaptive immune response, which is your T cells, B cells and antibodies. Again, this can be good because you don't want to be overrun with T cells and B cells. And in fact, vitamin D treatment can benefit some people who suffer from autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. But again, too much vitamin D can attenuate the adaptive immune response too much. So this is the basics of how vitamin D affects the immune system. But what do the actual studies tell us? Unfortunately, the majority of studies looking at vitamin D and COVID are observational studies, which means the information available is much less reliable than from a randomised controlled trial. However, it would be unethical to do a randomised trial where people's vitamin D levels were actually kept at a deficient level. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis of studies looking at vitamin D levels and infection or COVID severity. And in particular, it compares people who are vitamin D deficient with people who aren't. This figure looks at the effect of vitamin D deficiency on COVID severity. The figure on the left marked A is a forest plot of studies that were adjusted for confounders. And the figure on the right marked B is a forest plot of studies that haven't been adjusted for confounders. And if you want to know more about forest plots, I explain them in more detail in my video about ivermectin meta-analyses. But the key thing to know for these forest plots is that if the diamond is on the right of the black line, it means there is an effect, and the further to the right, the greater the effect. So the first thing to note is that once you account for confounders, the effect of vitamin D levels on severity is considerably lower, reducing from an odds ratio of 10.61 to 2.57. And this makes sense because we know that a lot of risk factors for COVID are also associated with low levels of vitamin D. So if we account for those risk factors, you would expect the effect of vitamin D to decrease. Importantly, though, we do still see an increased risk of COVID severity in those who are vitamin D deficient. This, of course, doesn't mean there is no risk in those who aren't vitamin D deficient. Now, before you all rush off and start downing huge amounts of vitamin D, there are a few important caveats to this analysis. Firstly, they compared people who were vitamin D deficient with those who weren't. So if you're not actually vitamin D deficient, this analysis provides no evidence that vitamin D will help you. That being said, there are a lot of people who are vitamin D deficient. A few other things to note are that all of the studies included in the meta-analysis were assessed as being low quality, and the studies that are adjusted for confounders didn't necessarily account for all confounders. The other important thing to consider is what is known as reverse causality. And this means that severe COVID could be the cause of low vitamin D levels as opposed to it being the other way around. In this seriously cool study, they infused healthy volunteers over three hours with a bolus dose of lipopolysaccharide, which is a substance that causes systemic inflammation. And what they did then was they measured circulating vitamin D levels over time. And this is what they found. Essentially, as inflammatory markers rose, plasma vitamin D levels decreased and were lowest when plasma cytokines were highest. But they did return to baseline six hours after the infusion. So we really can't say for sure whether COVID is made worse by low vitamin D levels or whether severe COVID causes a decrease in vitamin D levels. That being said, it is certainly biologically plausible that lower vitamin D levels would lead to more severe COVID. And it is definitely not a good idea to be vitamin D deficient in general. So what if you're not actually vitamin D deficient? Is there any benefit in taking vitamin D supplements? The simple answer is we don't know because there really aren't many quality randomized controlled trials. However, there is one good quality trial and it was published in JAMA 
And in this trial, they looked at the effect of a single high dose of vitamin D on the length of hospital stay for patients with moderate to severe COVID. And vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, so a high single dose will stick around. The study included 240 hospitalised patients, some who were vitamin D deficient at baseline and some who weren't. However, regardless of their baseline vitamin D status, there was no difference in length of hospital stay whether or not they got vitamin D or placebo. And similarly, there was no difference in mortality. So in hospitalised patients at least, there was no benefit in treating COVID with vitamin D. Of course, it could be argued that it's too late by the time you get to hospital and you should be taking vitamin D sooner. Now, there are a few other randomised controlled trials that have been done, but they have all been too small to show any meaningful results. However, there have been a large number of trials looking at the effects of supplementing with vitamin D on the incidence of catching a respiratory infection in general. And as luck would have it, someone has done a meta-analysis. And here it is. Now, of course, we can't say that this is definitely relevant to COVID, but it's the best we have at the moment. All up, they aggregated data from 43 randomised controlled trials covering 48,488 participants. And this is what they found. There is a lot on this forest plot, but two things are apparent. Firstly, there is a lot of heterogeneity amongst the trials. They're all over the place. But, and this is secondly, overall, there is a small, modest benefit from taking vitamin D supplements and it is statistically significant. The authors also did some subgroup analyses, and this is where it gets really interesting. They grouped trials based on the amount of vitamin D the participants took, and what they found was that only participants who took between 400 and 1,000 international units of vitamin D per day saw a benefit. If participants in the trial took either more or less, there was no benefit. And just to make it a bit clearer, this is just the trials where people got between 400 and 1,000 international units of vitamin D per day, and the trials where people got over 2,000 international units per day. With the lower amount, the odds ratio was 0.7 compared with 0.92 for all trials combined. However, for the higher amount, the odds ratio was 1.05, which means the risk of respiratory infections was actually higher than placebo. However, this wasn't actually statistically significant though, so we can't say that higher doses of vitamin D are actually worse than placebo, but we can say that they don't help. And these findings are consistent with the information I discussed earlier in the video that showed that vitamin D can be harmful if serum concentrations exceed 125 nanomoles per litre, and also it's consistent with vitamin D's multiple roles, both supporting and attenuating the immune system. Now, finally, I'd like to discuss a paper that has been doing the rounds on social media and many people are using to discuss taking mega doses of vitamin D, or in some cases, even suggesting that vitamin D is an alternative to vaccination. Now, Professor Greg Tucker Kellogg has made an excellent video that provides some tips on spotting scientific misinformation, and I will provide a link to it in this video's description to help you assess papers for yourself. But I will point out a few red flags on this paper before we get into the meat of the paper. The first red flag is the journal itself as well as the publisher. MDPI, which is the publisher, did manage to get themselves removed from the list of predatory journals, but they have generally got a pretty bad reputation in the scientific community. And if you have seen my video on the dodgy spike protein study, that was also published in an MDPI journal. However, in the case of this particular journal, Nutrients, it's actually a bit worse because a number of members of the editorial board, including the executive editor, actually resigned en masse three years ago because they were being pressured to publish mediocre papers. Although in the case of the paper we are discussing, mediocre is a bit too generous a description. An important thing to check with scientific papers is if the authors have any conflicts of interest. And usually there will be a conflicts of interest statement published. And this is a statement for this paper. The authors declare they have no competing interests. Well, that's good to know, 
except it's not true. The first author is actually selling a book all about the benefits of taking vitamin D supplements. This should have been declared. Now, the final red flag is the amount of time spent on peer review. According to the information provided, the paper was submitted, assessed by the editor, assessed by the peer reviewers, reassessed by the editor, sent back to the authors and revised and resubmitted in a space of 11 days. This is just not long enough for a proper peer review process. And reading the paper, it is hard to believe it was reviewed by anyone with any expertise in the field. And believe it or not, the problems start with the title. It claims to be a systematic review and meta-analysis. It is neither. It is not even a bad version. It just isn't. So this is the key figure from the paper, and it's what's known as a scatter plot. The blue dots show population level vitamin D levels for 20 countries in Europe compared with mortality from COVID. And the orange crosses are the results from some observational hospital studies. They claim to have corrected these results for confounders, but they have only used a very limited number of confounders and they apparently did the correction with a model that they downloaded or a program, I think, that they downloaded from The Economist, which is really not how you do science. As you can see, the dots are all over the place, but that hasn't stopped them from determining what is known as a line of best fit. And the green line is the line of best fit for all the dots. They then point out that this line crosses the axis at 50.7 nanograms per milliliter. So this is a theoretical point where no deaths will occur. There are two problems with this. The first thing is that just because you can draw a line through some dots doesn't mean the line is valid. To determine if it is valid and a linear relationship actually exists, you calculate what is known as the R squared number. The R squared number is between zero and one, and the closer it is to one, the better the linear fit. Well, the calculated R squared in this case is 0 0.133, which is of course nowhere near one, and not far off zero. This means there is no linear relationship whatsoever between vitamin D levels and mortality, and the whole premise of the paper is rubbish. And even if there was a linear relationship, it wouldn't be valid to extrapolate the line beyond the data points because, as we previously discussed, vitamin D has been found to have a U-shaped relationship between levels and outcomes. So, in summary, there isn't a lot of definitive evidence on vitamin D and COVID, and some studies are downright dodgy. But we do know that vitamin D is essential for a well-functioning immune system, and it is very likely that being vitamin D deficient will have an adverse effect if you become infected. We also know that taking between 400 and 1,000 international units of vitamin D can help prevent respiratory infections in general, but higher doses won't. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.